This is Sue Pitts with the Small Business Development Center in Iowa. Um, we are doing our Smart Start course and we are on lesson three, critical issues and decisions. So there are many different issues and decisions, the kind of like miscellaneous, so we kind of put them all in here that you really need to consider. You've, you've gone through the business planning process, you know your model, and so these are things that just kind of miscellaneous things to consider and to make decisions before you start. So we're going to cover entry options, choosing key partners, selecting a business location, naming and branding, and then finally just finalizing your operating systems, your management, your marketing procedures, and all of those plans, putting systems into place. So entry options, a lot of times you know you're, you're just going to start a business or you're going to buy a business or you're going to franchise a business. But I think no matter what you're choosing, it, it's, it's well worth your time to kind of look at those options. You know, buying an existing business is great if they have a good reputation, if they have a good name, and if what you're buying is worth it. You know, a lot of times they will say, you know, this business is $500,000, and if you really look into it, their equipment is old, out of date, you know, their customer base really isn't that great, their financials really aren't that great. So it might be a better option to keep that concept and start your own. So looking, you know, when someone comes up with an existing business, we really talk about, you know, what are the pros and cons of starting your own and buying your own equipment or buying this? A lot of times it's buying that business because that reputation was built up. But sometimes you might find where it makes more sense to start on your own. Um, buying a franchise. You know, buying a franchise is kind of, you know, what people think a simpler way. You know, I get their systems are in place. They do the marketing for me. Um, but there are good, good franchises, and there are some that might not have those systems in place. So you really want to look at those kinds of things about, you know, is, is this a way to go, or is it, you know, maybe I don't do the franchise, but do a similar business and do my own systems and do my own marketing. It might, you know, what are the benefits versus the pros? The other thing about a franchise is you are pretty locked into decisions. Um, you cannot bring on different product lines when you see a problem in your community, uh, um, you know, to, to change, kind of disrupt their model. Um, you're pretty locked into what their R&D company is doing or what their R&D or research and development um, is doing and finding out. Um, sometimes that's good. Sometimes that might not match what your market needs. And so you really are locked in. The other thing that you're locked in is, um, marketing. They will have their marketing plans and if you see other things you might not be able to do that to do those you know other opportunities and break kind of from their model of what they're doing. So looking into those things and making sure that you're comfortable with their systems and their rules what you can and cannot do is always very smart looking at a franchise. And the last entry option of course is just starting afresh. Um, again just looking at all three models and maybe you know if you're looking at starting a restaurant or a printing company or something like that at least reaching out to see if there's companies to buy and if it would be worth it that way or if there's a franchise if that's something you're comfortable with and just taking the time to look at all those different entry options. The next thing is choosing key partners and that is definitely a part of the business model canvas that we talked about but super important you only know what you know and you don't have to be alone in your business. So making sure that you're bringing in a good team. If you're a solopreneur, you do want to make sure that you're bringing in, you know, outsourcing different things that you cannot handle, that you don't have time for. That might be like accounting, marketing, lawyers, an HR person that can kind of go through things with you. Um, so choosing, and then also suppliers, so professionals, and those outsourcing and your team is probably the number one thing to look at as far as choosing key partners. But also who are you buying your inventory from? Who are you working with and um, having them supply you with you know, the things that you need to make money? Um, are, you know, are they helpful? Are they um, valuable? Those kind, you know, so really researching the different suppliers 
and things that you need so you're not just picking, you know, this is the one that everyone uses or this is the first one I found. Informal advisors, people that you might not be paying, paying them, um, but people that will be act as your mentors. Um, I have a lot of small businesses that have started an advisory board. Um, you know, they ask people that are smart in different things and, and their mentors and maybe have a meeting monthly or quarterly or even annually and just kind of going through your books and here's your plans and here's your strategy and they will offer some very good advice. These kind of advisors, of course, can be the SBDC. So make sure that you're reaching out to us, your SBDC counselor because we are your first advisor and we will be there with you from your start to the end. Other informal advisors include other business owners that own like businesses or that have run a business in your community for a very long time would be a great mentor. Um, bankers, other business advisors, community economic development professionals or your chambers. So really anyone that you can think of that can help in your industry or help you kind of navigate your community. Um, marketing, all of that kind of stuff. So I think it's very important to build that team. Um, the other thing is choosing, like I said before, your team, your key employees. What do I need to fill that, you know, if I'm gonna hire a team and not be a solopreneur, what are the things that I am good at and what are the things that other people can fill in and do, you know, better than me? Um, so filling that, that team with people to fill all the different holes in the roles that your business needs. Selecting a business location is a very, very important decision and sometimes not something that we think about or when we're in a small Iowa rural community, you know, there's a, there's a, a space open so I'm gonna you know, put my restaurant there. But you do wanna look at different issues and make sure that you're not getting into a situation that you can't get out of. Do your customers come to your business? So you wanna make sure if your customers are coming to your business, there's a whole lot of different issues you wanna look at. Is there parking? Is there security? Is it safe? You also want to consider where your other competition is located. Not necessarily because you don't want to be by your competition. In some instances, you don't want to be by your competition. Um, but in some, you want to be kind of in that same area so they can make choices. If you look at um, you know, fast food restaurants, they're all clustered in the same area for a reason um, because that's where people go to eat and you can make different choices. Um, so you want to look at your competition and, and where that's located and if that's a factor where, whether you go on the other side of town or kind of near them. Will your product or service require specific location or building specs? Do you, is, there, is infrastructure and transportation an issue? Are trucks coming in and out of there and is there good access for that? Do you, is there a spot that you can have deliveries? You know, so just going through your business model and making sure that you know everything that you need and probably the last and, and really important aspect of location is you know, really looking at how much space you need and having that fine division between, you know, you're not getting too much space and spending too much money, but if you're going to grow, is there space to grow without moving your location, changing your address, you know, spending the money there. So really looking at through the planning process and doing your business planning and your model and your business plan and your and your cash flows, you should be able to see how, you know, how you, what your growth trend should be or what your goals are and to kind of look at, okay, so according to the projection I did, in three years we're growing to this much, can the, but this space is way too small to handle that. So you know, that would be something to consider. So naming and branding. In my experience, naming is probably one of the hardest things for small businesses to do um, because you just get lost in, you know, you might pick something and then you're thinking it in your head and then you're like, yeah, I don't like that anymore. That's dumb. Or um, I have had businesses that haven't started for two years because they cannot choose a name to file with the Secretary of State's office. Um, so we're here to help with that, but I, you know, and I think it's really important, but I think it's something that, um, you know, as important as it is, your model you know, the, the product that you deliver, everything else that you're putting into it is, is more important. So kind of getting past that hurdle and just naming your business 
Um, there are a lot of businesses that um, have named their business and then in 10 years have had to change it. One that I worked at was um, Gateway 2000. And after 2000, it wasn't really relevant because now it's 2020. So they took off the 2000 and just did Gateway. Um, they did fine with that, it wasn't a big deal. So there are a lot of larger companies that end up having to change their name. So my biggest advice to you is just kind of get over that hurdle. And here are some things that we will go through with you and help you or things for you to check. Um, I always say just like brainstorm your, your names and then kind of walk away for it from it. Have friends look at it and see what they think, but not getting too stuck on it. So once you come up with, you know, that five to 10 different names, go through this process. Um, check your domain name to see if it's selected. Just because someone has your domain name doesn't mean that you can't name your business that, but you do want to make sure it's not a like business in the same market that you're at. So that would be very important. You can have a different website address. You know, you might put IA on the back of the end of it. It's getting harder and harder to have a unique domain name. You can change the last extension so you can have .com, you can basically buy any last extension. The thing that you really want to make sure of is though the first part of it because everyone is going to go to the internet and put .com because we're just used to it. So you just want to make sure that there isn't a business that you don't want to be affiliated with or you don't want to send. Like if it's a competitor, you don't want to send all of your customers to your competitor's website. Um, so being thoughtful about what you're going to do for your domain name, but it doesn't necessarily have to be yourbusinessname.com but just looking at different factors and seeing if you can get past that. After you do that, you wanna just go to Google and put your business name in there and see what comes up. Um, are there, you know, you might not have found them with the domain name, but there might be other businesses in your area that have that same name. There might be other businesses um, that have that same name that aren't in your industry and maybe in an industry that you do not wanna be affiliated with. Um, so you just want to check that name, see what the meanings are, all of that kind of stuff. So you're just thoroughly checking, like, oh, yeah, I know that business, and it is an adult bar. You probably don't want to be affiliated with that if it's famous or if it's in your area. So just doing your due diligence there. Next, you'll want to check with USPTO.gov, U.S. Department of Patents and Trademarks, um, just to see if there's any registrations on that business name. If you're going national, you'll want to think about trademarking your business name. If you're local, you might not. But the thing is, is if someone else has that trademark, um, you do not want to get a cease and desist five years later. You know, maybe you're just running in um, Des Moines, Iowa as your business or, um, you know, Dubuque and it's your business and you're just local. Um, but you hit the jackpot and you get an article in a national newspaper and someone sees that name and they're like, eh, that's my trademark. They will send you a cease and desist. Um, and that's just something that you don't want to fight. You also then want to go to Iowa Secretary of State, State's Business, and you can just click on their business entity, entities search and just put that name in and just make sure that there's no other businesses with that name in the state of Iowa. So when you get an LLC or you, file, or you register your business in the state of Iowa, you do it through Secretary of State's office, and you can, they cannot have more than one name in the state of Iowa. So you're kind of protecting that name, at least in the state. Um, you also want to go to Google Keyword Planner and just doing some further research on how many people type in those keywords. You know, when, when you're Googling something, Will they type, you know, that might help you name your business um, if, if it's something that people are really searching for. So say it's Council Bus Painting or Des Moines, Iowa or Cedar Rapids, um, 3D printing. Kind of look at 3D printing and find out what keywords come up, what people search for. And those keywords might be really good in the title of your business because people are searching for that. So some best practices when naming your business, say it out loud and have other people say it out loud. I don't know about you or anyone else, but when I look at a business and I don't know quite how to pronounce it or say it, I'm a little embarrassed. I don't want to say it. 
you know, so making me your customer comfortable and not having to correct me in saying your business name is, is important um, in, in retaining customers. Um, I, the last thing you want to do is like they say your business name and you correct them. It makes me feel not smart. So have people say it out loud. Make sure that you can pronounce it. Try it without spaces because if they type it in, if that's your, going to be your domain name, you want to make sure what it looks like without spaces. Sometimes other words can be spelled when you take out spaces, so you just want to make sure it's clean. No dirty words, things like that. There's been some, some good examples of how when you take out the spaces, the whole name and meaning of the business changes, and so you just want to look at that if that's what your domain name is going to be. You want to, especially if you're looking at growing outside of your local area or your region, you want to avoid general names just because when you have general names like Council Bluffs Painting or Anderson Painting or Sue Pitts' Cookies or Sue's Cookies, you might run into more and more competition that has those names. Um, plus, you know, they might be trademarked. They're just general um, and not rememberable and, and you might be associated again with another business with that name. Kind of like saying it out loud, avoid difficult foreign or misspelled words. Um, and this is my opinion, but, <laughs> um, and I work for an organization called the SBDC, but I think it's complicated when people name their business acronyms um, because there can be so many different meanings of acronyms. So if you're an ABC company, that, you, know, you don't know really what that means. It has meaning to those words, but there might be another ABC company that has a completely different meaning. So just being careful of those. And, and acronyms are really hard to remember. Um, being from the SBDC, we are confused with a lot of different organizations with acronyms just because they're not memorable. They don't have a meaning to them. You know, there's no meaning to SBDC whereas Small Business Development Center or something else has a meaning. A um, little bit more memorable. So I would be aware of those. I know like when people make really long names, they do the acronym, but I just you know, really think about that and how that's going to be remembered. Um, also, after you kind of pick your name, you want to take the time to develop your identity. What are the colors that are going to identify your business? Develop out that logo and the tags that you would use for your business. Um, so just developing that, that identity before you move on and having that logo. You need that logo and that, that name for everything you do going forward in starting the business. So that's probably the, one of the first things that you want to do. Establish those col colors. What fonts? What's, your, you know, what's the look of your business, the feel of your business, the vibe of your business? And kind of set those up. On the logo thing, when you do a logo, you want to make sure that someone develops the logo professionally. Um, that's not saying that your daughter couldn't, couldn't develop it for you, but like drawing something and then taking a photo on your iPhone and then using that for your logo is probably not the best way. You want that logo created so there's a file called an EPS file or an Illustrator file. So you can go back to that and send it to your printer change the direction of it, change the colors, and have a very good copy of it for the life of the business or for the life of that logo. Um, so I, you know, thinking about investing in someone to do, um, to create your logo, there's a lot of different resources in your community in Iowa that can help you create your, your logo. Um, and there's also resources online like um, Crowdspring and 99designs they're, they're resources that you can put out your concept for your logo and people will join a contest um, at the price that you've set. So say it's $250 or $300. And you'll be able to see different artists and different renditions of, of their take on your business and your logo and come up with one that really matches. And you will always get that EPS file, that file that can be changed um, won't, you know, if you use a photo, it's not going to look great after using it a couple times. It won't lose its um, crispness and, and relevance. And the last part of critical decisions is just looking at your marketing, management, and operating plans. 
systems, you know, I talked about franchises and the good thing about a franchise is they set up systems. It's why they went from being a small business to a franchise in the first place because they thought very carefully about their suppliers and how they get food, the system of how they make the food if we're talking about a restaurant business, the system of hiring people, everything has a system. And the reason why they went from a small business to a franchise is because they did that. So even if you're not looking at franchising, I think it's really important to think of your business as going to that point. Set up those systems. Someone can walk in there if something happens to you and they know exactly what to do. Things to kind of think of when you're looking at that, the very first thing is um, a website and an internet presence. Um, set up your website. Yes, you need a website. I've had people, I haven't had one person yet that um, I, they convinced me that they didn't need a website. Maybe a few, and it's because they had a set customer and they weren't going out to another customer. But a website is something you own, not Mark Zucker Zuckerberg and Facebook. Um, you have control of it. No one can pull it down. Um, and it's your 24-7 brochure. Um, it's your place that you can make announcements. With COVID-19, that was very important to be able to have a place to say, we're open, or we're doing this, or we have curbside pickup, you know, whatever it was. So that's your space. Facebook's fine for that, um, but you can't control who sees it. You can't control, like, if you post on your Facebook page, if people are going to actually see that in their feed. Um, with a website, they can go right to it and get the information that they need at that time. Creating a website, also setting up your social media channels. Creating a website doesn't have to mean spending $10,000 on a website. Working with your SBDC counselor, we can work with you and find out what you need to have on that website, the content that you need. Um, we have lots of different templates that we can help you kind of build that content out. There are resources that make powerful websites that are easy for you to do if you choose to take the time. And I understand that a lot of people don't want to take that time and there's a lot of other things that you have to do besides running a website, right? But um, knowing those resources and knowing what kind of information needs to be on that website and creating that and then whether you hire someone and just know what you need and know that you don't have to spend $20,000 um, or there are a lot of, like I said, builders out there. One that we like in the SBDC network is Wix.com. Squarespace is another one. There are lots of them. Those are ones that, at least in my center, we have vetted out and know that they um, are powerful. Um, you can get search engine optimized very easily. Um, they don't own your domain name. Um, and they're very, very flexible and very easy. It's basically, you know, like working with Microsoft Word, um, click and drag, um, filling things in. Because those types of resources are out there, you can also find people to help you do it that have an interest in it for a little less than, you know, maybe because you're a small business. At this point in time, you can't hire a full-fledged advertising agency. So there are options to help you get online. Um, feasibly and then as you grow you might advance to bigger and better. You also want to make sure that you're creating your brochures, your menus, all of those things. You want to make sure that you look into bookkeeping systems. QuickBooks Online is, is a very, very popular one. Um, WaveApps.com is another great one but just making sure, you know, I, a year ago I would say as long as you're keeping track of your expenses and you don't want to go online, that's fine. COVID happened and I've changed, totally changed my mind. And I think that all of the counselors throughout the state of Iowa would agree with me that in some way or form, you need to be doing formal bookkeeping online. Also, if you're going to resource that out, um, you need to have your hands on it somehow. You do not want to completely give control to someone outside of your business, all of your financials and not knowing what's going on. So you need to be looking at that, I would prefer you to be looking at it once a week, but at least once a month, knowing you know, um, what's coming in, what's going out, what's due next month, um, so that you have an idea of where you're sitting before tax time. Um, I've had many customers come to me and say, um, I don't know, I don't know, I usually find out like how I did last year on like, you know, after I file my taxes. Um, I think it will, it's worthwhile and worth your time. 
and worth not failing in your business um, if you look at it, like I said, on a weekly basis or at least a monthly basis with your accountant. Customer relationship management systems. So if you have a B2B business or even you know, um, you're working with B2C, how, what kind of systems can you have to keep track of what people have purchased? How often have you talked to them? Um, emails and automated emails and making sure that they're return customers. So a customer relationship management system is something very worthwhile to look into. And again, something that we can help you one-on-one -on -one to kind of decipher. There's many out there if you would Google it. If you're a hairdresser or do one-on-one -on -one or virtual appointments in this, in this day and age, an online booking system is very, very efficient. I use one and I think it saves me in just my counseling services two hours a day from going back and forth in emails and phone calls to figure out when people can meet. I send them to my calendar. They sign up for an open slot. The Zoom meeting at the, right now is sent right to them and boom, we just get on. So I think it's very worth looking at online booking systems if you're doing consulting um, or some kind of service. Establishing a marketing plan, I think, you know, that's for yourself. You not, don't necessarily need to give that to your bank, not all the time, but establishing a marketing plan, that's something that we work with people a lot. Just coming up with, here's the marketing plan, here's the calendar, here's the tactics we're going to use in a certain time of year. Um, you know, helping, we help you, may, may, we might help you um, create social media posts that you can just, you know, just have an arsenal of social media posts that, when it comes time to um, advertise, you can add, you know purchase advertising on Facebook and have those kind of in your toolkit. So having that marketing plan, I think, is very important. Um, and then finally, looking at point of sale systems. Um, how are you keeping track of sales, and how do you keep in track of sales? Is it something that you need to go beyond, like the QuickBooks or the Wave, so that you can keep track of certain characteristics of your sales? Um, Probably most important in grocery stores, retail stores, restaurants, things like that. So you do need to, or business to consumer types of things where you have a, an influx of sales coming in your door all the time. Keeping track of that is, is very important. So that's it for those critical decisions. And lesson four will be legalities, permits, and licenses.